It says the third intention there. All right, so uh, the the author, may Allah be pleased with him and pleased with you. May, uh, may Allah benefit us from him and benefit us from you. He says, intend to increase the gatherings of Muslims so to partake so to partake uh, in the great virtue of being counted among them. As the envoy of Allah, sallallahu alayhi he said, whoever increases the number of a people is counted as one of them. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, be with the majority because the wolf takes the stray from the herd on the meaning of the aforementioned hadith. Uh, in the prophetic tradition about those engaged in gatherings of dhikr in, in mosques, Um, Allah Az- Azzawajal, Most High says My angels are a company Whose associates Shall not be amongst the rich Or among the wretched 37 He says it's from the Quran From Ali Amran Alright So uh, If we continue in terms of Of the intention of sitting in the masjid So previously in the first chapter We discussed the intentions of going to the masjid Going to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so for us, that's going to the prayer, even the, the prayer mats, you know, the the the, um, the sajda, that going to it, going, I want to go and pray, I want to go make my prayers, make sure that, I, you know, I'm, I'm praying in a place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with. So that was the first part. This part is when I'm actually there, when I've come into the masjid, and, and before we actually go to the sitting, it's to go into the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's sunnah to pray, rak'atan, two rak'ah, tahiyyat al-masjid, which, which means that, it's basically we're saying to Allah, I'm grateful for you allowing me to enter into your house. Right? Because as, as we read in the first chapter, those who go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only someone can go to someone's house who's invited. So that means Allah is actually, it's the qadr, it's the decree of Allah that we've entered into his home. The house of Allah, I mean, it's not his home home, but it's the masjid. Right? Metaphorically speaking. So when when a person is the guest of of someone who's noble or someone who's powerful or someone who's wealthy, they're treated in a particular way, right? And walillah and mathal ala doesn't compare to Allah. So when we go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is the most wealthy, the most powerful. So he's going he's gonna to look after his guest in a particular way. And if uh, we've got that tawfiq, we've got that, that, um, that divine permission to enter the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah is going to look after us in a, in a particular way. Allah is going to make our lives, inshallah, as we shall, easier. So that's what this part of it's about. When we sit on our prayer mats that we've made waqaf or otherwise, when we go to the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're, and we're sitting there, what are the intentions that we have? So he says, the, the first part of it, he says, to increase the gatherings of Muslims. Why is it, why is it so, so important to increase the gatherings of Muslims? Because the greater the gathering, the greater the rewards. The greater amount of people gathered in one place, looking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, in their hearts, they're asking, tawajjuh, the word is, that they're seeking the countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, the greater the rewards, like Arafah. Right, that's huge, millions of people go to the, the plains of Arafah during the time of Dhul-Hijjah, the ninth day of Dhul-Hijjah, the ninth day of this, what is it, like the 10th Islamic month? No, 11th. 11th Islamic month. Anyway, of Dhul-Hijjah, and the... Um, Twelfth, excuse me, the twelfth Islamic month, right? Um, and they're there, and they're asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So when huge numbers like that are gathered in a particular place, then the knowledge of Allah, the, the 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 way that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala looks at his at his calm at his at his creation increases, and the malaika, the angels that are around, and you know the nur that's coming, the the light that's coming from these people reflects into the skies because it's such a huge number, such a huge gathering. And then he says to be counted among them, right? Irrespective, so there's a there's a prophetic tradition that says that the hilq al dhikr or hilq al ilm, the gatherings of of um, of uh, of knowledge or the gatherings of remembrance, they they are a raub min riyad al jannah. They're like a, a little garden from the gardens of jannah. In other words, the effect that one feels from being in the gatherings of remembrance of Allah or the gatherings of, of knowledge is same as the effect or very similar to the effect that one gets from sitting in one of the gardens in paradise. That's the effect that it has on one's soul, on one's being, on one's state, on one's condition, and even on one's physical state. 
And then the Prophet, the hadith continues, it's a fair long hadith, and it's also in other narrations, different, it's narrated differently in the prophetic tradition. And that Allah, Allah the Prophet said, so Allah forgives all those people. And then one of the, one of the um, I'm not sure, I can't remember if someone asked or the Prophet says, even someone that, that came to meet somebody else. So someone who wasn't, wasn't, didn't go, the intention of that individual that came at the end wasn't to sit in the gathering of remembrance or the gathering of knowledge. It was just to meet someone. But because of the blessings of that gathering, how, how immense the blessings are in the gathering of remembrance of Allah or the, or the gathering of, of seeking knowledge, Allah forgives that individual that came without an intention even. That's how, that's how immense uh, the, these, these gatherings are. So that's what he means thereby in the great virtue of being counted among them. That's the connotation. It's not the meaning. It's the connotation that irrespective of one's state, one's condition being, and he says here, he talks about ikhlas, even if he's not mukhlis, even if he's not sincere or she's not sincere, the person just came an extra, you know what I mean? The third leg, isn't that what they say? The sixth toe. So if someone came like that, but they're in that gathering, that's it. They're included amongst those people. And he says, as the Messenger of Allah, the envoy of Allah والسلام, said, whoever increases the number of a people is counted as one of them. So that's the being counted amongst those individuals that are doing something great for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just by being in that gathering, one gets the reward as though he was or she was in that same state. And he والسلام, said, be with the majority because the wolf takes the stray from the herd. So... So it only mentions one in here, but there's two two hadith. The greater the, the greater the gathering, for in the al oh no, he just he says it differently, excuse me. He says, But in the in the ba yaqhadu al qasiyata al sharida. So he's saying that the bigger the gathering, and that's that's herd mentality, right? Like you see it, you watch the documentaries, the wildebeests, and they got the lions, right? The bigger the gathering, the bigger the group, the bigger the herd in that regard. The less chance the lions have. They have. What do they have to do? Even though the lions got. You ever seen a lion? You ever gone to the zoo or somewhere and seen a lion? Like its head is like seriously, it's that big. The thing's massive and its paws are like that, and its teeth, canines or whatever, are like this. And yet it can't, it can't attack the, the whole group of wildebeest. What does it have to do? And it's mainly the lionesses. The lion just he's the king. He just kicks back. But what do the lionesses have to do? They have to separate a sick one or an old one or a young one, right, away from the herd to be able to hunt it. Even though there's a, there's a what do they call it, a pride of lions and there's 10, 15 lions, they still, they still can't break into the herd. They still, because the herd's strong together. And that's how the believers are. What does he say? Al-Jama'atu Rahma wal Firqatu Adab, alayhi salatu salam. The Jama'at, being together, being unified, is Rahma. Is rahmah from Allah, rahmah between themselves and, and being disparate or disunified is adab, it's punishment. And we know that. We know that. We know the lives we live. We've heard how the predecessors lived and how we live. We know what's going on in, in Muslim countries, so called Muslim majority countries. We know what's going on there. And it's, we know it's painful. It's adab, it's agony, it's torment, it's anguish. So the Prophet ﷺ, that's why he gives he gives that that example that the 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 Ali says that the the al uh, qasiyah is the um, it's not it's not always a sheep but it's the animal the herd animal right that's al sharida that's it's disparate and it's away from the herd that's the one that gets taken by the wolf in this example of the and the example we gave the lion, because it's it's weak on its own. It's weak on its own. And it's a metaphor about who the shaitan gets. The shaitan gets those, like, un- unfortunately, misfortunately, first world problems for Muslims were individuals. Oh, I don't follow anyone. Sorry? Oh, I don't, I don't follow anyone. Who, who are you? Where did you come from? What authority do you have to make your own decisions about your about the faith? It's not, uh, sahih, it's your faith. Sahih, it's your faith. But you didn't make it up. You didn't send the revelation. You weren't there. 
You didn't, the, 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 you didn't get any power from Allah Azza wa Jalla to make law or not make law. And it's a lay person. Or right, maybe it's someone who's been a scholar, their father was a scholar, their grandfather was a scholar, they grew up among scholars, they memorized the Quran when they were seven, they memorized Al Ummahat al Sitta, the six main books of Hadith when they were 12. Up to and then they they stayed in a seminary, an Islamic seminary, till they were 20, 21, and they became a mufti. That person, maybe, maybe, but someone who's a lay person, lay Muslim, doesn't know, you know, al qur min al bu'a. They say, right? This is a, they say it's just like a statement. They don't know their head from their toe, right, or their, whatever. And they, oh, I don't want to follow anyone. Yeah, great, mate, good one. Well, I'm happy for you. You know, what do you mean you don't want to follow anyone? How did you learn how to drive? You just got in the car and drove your own self? No, you went. The instructor sat next to you and told you left, right, up, down, back, stop. What are you doing? This, that, this. But in your deen, you don't want to follow anyone. But when you went to get your L's and your, and your P's and whatever else, you had to get the driver, pay him money, the instructor, excuse me, pay him money, whatever, whatever, whatever. Oh, what about when you went to school? You learned your ABCs. You learned it by yourself? Is that where you learned it? Your one, two, threes by yourself? So it's illogical. It's completely Ill illogical, therefore unreasonable for an individual to say, oh, that's it, I'll just do my own thing in my deen. Imagine a person was to say that about, you know, oh, it's my deen. I know. Habib, what do you know? We don't even know about our own bodies. We start to feel a bit off. Oh, ring this hotline. Good, now everyone Google. Dr. Google, you know, whatever. I've got the symptoms. Tell me what the story is. Go to the hospital. Go here. When I was a billah, Allah, 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 Allah. Doctors, and it's not a process that you just go to one doctor. When was the last time you got sick and went to one doctor? This doctor and that doctor, and then a specialist. Wait three, four, five, six, seven, eight months. Mabad of shul, mabad of air, whatever's going on to get someone to, to diagnose your situation firstly, which is difficult, and then to get some sort of a you know treatment for your for your situation or some. And everyone's got a body. It's my body. I can chop my finger off. I can do whatever. But no one would do that. Because why? It's stupid. That's why. It's idiocy. Only someone who isn't full of their faculties would do something like that. And we would never accept it from anybody else. But in our deen, whoa, that's it. I don't follow anyone. I'll just do my own thing. Hey, good luck to you. Good luck. Right? That's what the Prophet's telling us. That's what the Prophet is telling us. If you want shaitan to overtake you, do your own thing. Go ahead and do your own thing. Because this deen is what? Wiratha. This deen is wiratha, which means it's inherited. In the Anbiya, la yarithu dirham aw dinara wa lakin yarithu al-ilm aw kama qal. The Prophets, their, their, their estates, their tariqa, in other words, what they inherit, what they give to people to inherit, isn't Gold or silver, dirham or dinar, right? Or dinar or dinhar. It's it's knowledge, and it has to be taken in a particular way. In other words, it has to be taken in that same way, like inheritance. If you were to inherit from your father or your mother, you've got to be a direct connection. You can't inherit from your grandfather if if you've got uncles and aunts, mum and dad. It's not going to work. They block you off. Yahjibunaka, right? Same thing with knowledge. You can't just pick up a book. Especially in English, yeah. After it's already been interpreted from one language to another, and it's the interpreter's interpretation of the meaning of a word, and so I understand the deen. It's not going to happen, yeah. Not, it's not going to happen. There's no, you know, it's impossible. Basically, basically, it's impossible. So that's why we stay with the jama'ah, and the bigger the jama'ah, that's why we're ahl sunnah wal jama'ah, as they've been termed, ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. Where the, the Sunnah of the Prophet same and the group. And that's why one of the hukums in our faith, one of the rulings is, is ijma'. When the majority of scholars agree on a particular thing, then that becomes a law in our faith. Why? Because it's the majority. It's, it's the majority of, of people who are authorized to interpret the faith, interpret the nasus, interpret the, 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 the primary texts. Okay, so when a person leaves the jama'ah, I'm on, I'll do my own thing. That's it. The wolf is eating the mean, the shaitan. The shaitan's all over that person. Educated or not educated. Even a person when they're in deen, yeah, even, even a person when they're highly, highly, highly educated. Like one time when we were in Tareem, one of the brothers, he wanted to get married. And Long story, but we went to the um, Majlis al-Fatwa, the gathering of, of 
in Tarim, where the Mufti of Tarim sits. Tarim is the city where Hamdulillah was studied in Hadramaut in Yemen. And who's there? Who goes to the Majlis? All the biggest worldwide top of the range scholars. And they, and they consult with each other. No one comes up and says, this is my view. Even the Mufti, he asks them, what do you reckon? What about this? And they pull the books off the shelves and they, they, you know, they know it. They memorized it, but they don't, they don't want to say something that maybe I memorized it wrong because someone's akhirah depends on it, not someone's life. Ah, life, one thing, but akhirah, eternal life, depends on it. They look through, they give opinions, and then the, the Mufti generally says, I'll get back to you. Even though he's surrounded by you know, 15 or 16 of, of the world's most renowned Shafi'i, in particular that Madhab Shafi'i scholars. They don't rush into these. Us, whoa, we read it somewhere, bang, fatwa straight away. Asra'akum lil fatwa, asra'akum lil nar. The Prophet knows about these things. So the one who's quickest with fatwa is the quickest to the fire. It's no joke. It ain't no joke, as they say. There's no mucking around in these things because it's about eternal life. It's about living the next life, inshallah. So the person who's away from the jama'ah, they're the one, basically, shaitan, meaning what? Their nafs, their own desires. And he says, um, in a prophetic tradition about those engaged in gatherings, and he says, when he, when he talks about the hadith, he says, alam an al-hadith. So he's not, he's not which, which is what he says there, he says, on the meaning of the aforementioned hadith. So he's not quoting directly from the prophetic tradition. He's saying that's what he's saying the meaning of the hadith because most of the time when these scholars write the books they don't have they don't have like their computers out and the internet on and they just from whatever they know from whatever Allah opens up upon them inclines them to they write so sometimes they know the hadith but they don't remember the exact words the prophet used so that's why he says that there that's why it says on the meaning of the aforementioned hadith he says in a prophetic tradition about those engaged in gatherings of dhikr in mosques I don't know if he says that here in Arabic. Yep, fil masajidi. I got a bit of an issue with that word mosques. You know, like uh, from my from my research, it was the um, Spanish well, after the, after they kicked out the Muslims from Spain. No, where's it from? It's disagreement. Yeah, it's there's disagreement. Yeah. There's, there's no agreement. Yeah. No. Thank you, Jazakallah khair. So maybe this, but the, what I heard was what I read many years ago was that. When the Spanish were kicking out the Muslims from Spain with the Inquisition, they used the word mosques, which in Spanish had the, the connotation of mosquitoes, like we're going to get rid of the, mos the, the Muslims like mosquitoes. Apparently it's something else. Could be the case. I don't know. That's history. Sometimes the narrations are, are reliable. Sometimes they're not. Like the Ottomans. I don't know if you heard about an Ottoman. It's like a piece of furniture that goes in your house. You put your feet on it. Yeah, well, the British came up with that same thing to get rid of the Ottomans. They said, we're going to put our feet on the Ottomans. Like we put on, that's why they named the Ottomans. But again, it's conjecture. It's conjecture. That's what is said. To, it's said to be the case. So anyway, masjid is a better word, and there's no reason why we can't use the word masjid. But I, I suppose the, the interpreter is saying that to make it clear to those people uh, who who were reading w without maybe having someone teach. He says, Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Most High says, My angels are a company associate uh, whose associates shall not be among the wretched. So what, what that means is, it's a bit convoluted in the English language, basically he's saying that, that those who are, in, who are in the company of angels won't be um, the one who's happy. In other words, you know, when we're, before we're, when we're born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts on our forehead, our rizq, and one of them is shaqi or sa'id. So sa'id is the person who goes to Jannah, shaqi is the person when other brother goes to the hellfire. So the ones who are in the gatherings of angels, yeah, the ones who are in the gatherings of angels in the houses of Allah, in other words, those who remember Allah by the, the actual remembrance or by learning and teaching, those people won't be of those who are in the hellfire, inshallah ta'ala. That's the, the connotation and the meaning of that. Okay? So any questions about any of that? Straightforward? There's a difficult note of the hadith on page 173. Oh, that's pretty long. It says in the hadith of Abu Huraira, it is related to the Prophet Allah said, Angels, Allah has angels who wander the streets looking for people to occupy who occupy themselves with the invocation of Allah when they find it's it is a very, very long hadith. Look, I didn't I didn't look at it so I, 
um, next next week, inshallah. How did you find that? Oh, it says there at the bottom. Uh, C translators notes. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, beautiful. So next week we can we can go into that. But what what I did want what I did want to do is is an extension of that last part of the hadith. It says my it says I'll prefer the Arabic. مَجَالِسَ الذِّكْرِ فِي مَسَاجِدِ يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مَلَائِكَةِ هُمُ الْقَوْمِ لَا يَشْقَى جَلِيسَهُمْ Right? So, that, I wanted to go from there to talk about Rabi' al-Awwal بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى which is the birth month of the Prophet Muhammad Because, look what the hadith is saying. Okay? It's saying those people who are in the gatherings of the remembrance of Allah, the remembrance of dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those people won't be in the hellfire. Right, those people won't be shaqi. Those people won't be Saeed means happy, so I suppose the other side is depressed, but depressed is hazan. It's, it's a bit of a difficult word. But those people won't be in the hellfire. And so in this month of Rabi' al Awwal, it's the birth month of the Prophet, it's narrated that he, he was born on the twelfth of Rabi' al Awwal. That in in this month, that traditionally throughout the Muslim world, that people have celebrated the Prophet of Allah. Not not just his birth, because it's not just about his birth. It's about his birth. It's about before his birth, Ali It's about it's about what they call the mithaq, right? The the anbiya, they all took a mithaq. It's a covenant with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that's really what we're celebrating. And it, when we talk about the Prophet of Allah we have to we have to see who he is, and that's what this month. That's what the scholars, the salaf, the, the, the you know, that's what the, the sahaba, the tabi'een, the tabi' al tabi'een. That's what all, all the righteous people throughout throughout history have done. They've used this occasion, this birth month of the Prophet of Allah as an excuse, if you like, to remember the Prophet of Allah to mention the virtues of the Prophet of Allah to mention the seerah, the biography of the Prophet of Allah to mention the history of the Prophet of Allah to mention how Allah's mentioned the Prophet of Allah to mention how the Prophet's mentioned the, himself والسلام, in the prophetic tradition. So, um, for us, for, the, the, for those, alhamdulillah, that believe in the shahadatan, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, the fundamental, there's two fundamental aspects to our to our faith. Firstly, to believe in Allah, and to believe in Muhammad Ali as the, as the final messenger sent to humankind by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala with the final revel, revelation that supersedes all other revelations. Fadl. Um, it is, it is. Two, three is the prof- I mean, really, a jama'ah is three, but two is fine if that's all you can do. But what the what the connotation is is in the house of Allah. That's the connotation. It it doesn't pr- preclude, doesn't you know, doesn't. It can be also people praying in a home somewhere, but the connotation in the hadith is that if there's a masjid that's nearby, people should be praying in the house of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Men in particular. And, and in uh, the madhab of, of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, for him it's wa- it's fard. It's an obligation for a man. There's conditions on it. If they're in a certain area, they should pray in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's, that's where the connotation is. And so if we continue, is, is that answer your question? So um, if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angels right, to be around those people who remember him subhanahu wa ta'ala and remember the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this month, this, it should be exacerbated. In other words, we should increase in the remembrance of the Prophet ﷺ because in reality, he's the secret. In reality, he's the secret to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way to get to Allah, the secret of, of the way to get into Allah Azza wa Jal is through the Prophet ﷺ. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni, yahbibkum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubukum. Whoever um, loves in kuntum tuhibbun, if you claim that you love Allah, Emulate me, emulate the Prophet because the Prophet he's the one who told us every there's not one letter, right? There's not one letter in the Quran that didn't come from his mouth, Ali said to Salam, his Mubarak mouth. Yeah, Sahih it's a revelation from Allah, no question. But if it didn't come from the vocal cords of the Prophet of Allah said from the tongue of the Prophet Salam, we would never have got it. So if anyone has doubt in the Prophet of Allah Salam, then they got doubt in the Quran. It's impossible because Anbiya, one of their qualities, one of their virtues is Al-Amana. They're trustworthy. Right? So if someone says, oh, the Prophet, this, that, that, this, they make up some garbage about the Prophet, something that's untrue. 
And they say, oh, we only believe in Quran. How did you get the Quran, champ? Where did it come from? It came from his mouth, Ali Sattu Salam. Came from his his vocal cords. Ali said, if he was untrustworthy, he could have said anything. It would have been written down by the Sahaba, and it would have been put in the Mus'haf, and then Sayyidina Uthman, when he kept it, we would have had that. But that's not the case, because he's a Sadiq al Amin. Ali Sattu Salam. And that's the, the quality of all prophets is al Amana. There's no khiyana, there's no treachery in, in the prophets. So, for us, it's an excuse. It's an excuse. Like in Ramadan, right? What do we focus on in Ramadan uh, outside of the fasting? What was that? Taqwa. Taqwa, definitely, if you can get it. Right? Quran. Isn't it month, the month of the Quran? It's an excuse. If you want to use another word, right? If you want to use another word. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran in Laylatul Qadr. Does that mean we should read the Quran? It's an excuse, right? It's an excuse to remember it. In in Dil Hijjah, when everyone goes off to Hajj, right? The those who don't go off to Hajj, what do they do? They don't cut their fingernails, they fast, Arafah. Why? It's an excuse for a use of a better word, right? I'm trying to make a point. It's an excuse, right? To say that, we you know, Hajj is on, let's worship Allah more. In, um, uh, uh, Allah Muhammad Ashura, right? The Prophet, that's how he did it. Well, what are the Jews doing? When he, Ali said to when he came to Medina, saw the Jews fasting on the 10th of, of Muharram. So what are they doing? He asked, oh, they're fasting. Why? Because that's when Allah emancipated them and saved the Musa from Fir'aun. We, are, we have priority to say the Musa over them. We're going to do it. It's an excuse for use of a better word. It's not. It's divine decree. But I'm just using that word to, to, to bring it in and talk about Rabi al-Awwil. Right? It's, why would we not celebrate the Prophet of Isa Why would we not talk about him every single day of the year? Not only every single day of the year, every single hour of the day. What about the Sahabi who came to Rasulullah? He said, Ya Rasulullah, if I dedicate so much time to your to making salawat, is that he said a third. He said, Is that is that good? He said, in Zitta Khair, if you increase, it's good. The Prophet said, What about half? He said, Yeah, that's good. What about three quarters? That's good. He said, Then the Prophet said, so if you made all your time salawat on me, I forget what the hadith is, but if you made all your time salawat on me, Allah would give you such and such all your time. Salawat on the Prophet of Allah, Sallam, Allah would give you such and such and such. He's telling him, Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, telling the Sahaba that spend all your time making salawat on me. We need an excuse? We don't, but because we're so busy in our lives and we're doing whatever we're doing the rest of the year, the scholars and the, 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 the Sahaba and, and the righteous people, the awliya, these people, they made an excuse for us. So for some time during the year, we can remember the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We can remember that he was before Sayyidina Adam. He says, Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I was the first, that's the Mithaq, the covenant. I was the first to take the covenant. That's what he says in the Hadith, Sahih Hadith as well. I was the first to take the covenant before Sayyidina Adam. I'm the first um, prophet to take the covenant and the last bi'thatan. In other words, the last to come to, to life. And then he was asked, Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when were you a prophet, Ya Rasulullah? He said, when Adam was between, between a soul and between a body, he was between being a soul and between being a body. In other words, between life coming into Sayyidina Adam, before life came to Sayyidina Adam. And there's a lot of conjecture amongst the scholars about how that came about and, and how that was. So, when we, when we hear what, what um, Habib Muhammad said, he says, and he's quoting the from the from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those people that are in that are in the gatherings of uh, remembrance, the angels are amongst them, as we said previously. And the people whom um, um, and the people whom the angels are amongst shall never go to the hellfire. La Yashqa. Or this is La Yashqa. They won't be of those people that are that are denied from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll be those people whom Allah is pleased with. So that's the reason. That's the, so the, the colloquial word that we're hearing these days is mawlid. What, what kind of a word is that? What about fiqh? 
What kind of a word is that? Fiqh, ilm al-fiqh. What's, what does fiqh mean in the Arabic language? Understanding. But that's not really what it is. It's not understanding. It's law. Are you with me or have I lost you? Something more and more. Right? It's called fiqh. Right? How to, what's halal and what's haram. What does the word fiqh mean in Arabic? It means to understand. But that's not what it is. It's law. But that's the word that was termed for it. That's the word that it became popular. That word fiqh. And so till now we use the word fiqh. Mawlid is the same. What's a mawlid? Has anyone ever been to a mawlid? What do they do at a mawlid? They remember what about the Prophet Sallallahu How he was, how he lived, how he died, what he did, what he went, what Allah said about him, who his forefathers were, who his mother was, who his father was, who his uncles were, what he did, Ali Sallallahu what Allah had planned for him, his virtues, basically. What's wrong with that? Is that haram? Of course not. What did he say in the hadith? If, if you spend all your time making salawat on me, it would be okay. And here we, here we are, the scholars, the awliya, the salihin, the righteous people saying that just this month focus. It shouldn't be only this month, this month. It should be all the time, but just to remind us, an excuse. So that's what a mawlid is. It's about the dhikr as sirah. It's the remembrance of the prophetic life and what he means to us and what he means to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Adam, Sayyidina Adam, when he was created, he looked on the arsh, what did he see? He said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And when he made the mistake, they say, when he made the mistake, Sayyidina Adam, and he ate from the tree, him and his wife, him and Hawa, Sayyidina Hawa, what did he say to Allah? He said, forgive me because of him, because of this person, Muhammad. How did he know about Muhammad? He said, he's on the arsh. His name's on the arsh. And there's some hadith that are not so strong, in other words, some Da'if, some Hassan, Mursal, etc., etc. You don't have to worry about that. But some hadith that say, if it wasn't for Sayyidina Muhammad, Allah wouldn't even have made Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam. That's how immense his status is, alayhi salatu salam. That's how immense his status is, alayhi salatu salam. And when we look at the celebration of the Prophet, alayhi salam, the biggest celebration of the Prophet, alayhi salam, was on the Day of Judgment. That's the ultimate celebration of the Prophet of Islam. So some people in this world, they've got a bit of issue, some Muslims in this world, they've got a bit of issue with, with what they call mubalagha, like over, you know, overdoing it when it comes to the Prophet of Islam. Hey, you can't. The, Allah's already spoken about it. He said, Ana Sayyidu Walad wa Adam. I am the, the Sayyid, the, the top of the range, the best of all of the children of, of Sayyidina Adam. He says, Ali says, Wala fakhar. He said, I'm not showing off. That's just how it is. Because what? Laka jaakum fi Rasulillahi uswatun hasana. He is the best of examples. So if he's not the best pe- of the best human being, the epitome of human beings, of a human being, then how can we follow him? How can we emulate him? And to love Allah, if we truly love Allah, what do we have to do? Emulate him. Are you following me or am I losing you? Is one plus one still equaling two or are we, the equation's falling apart? Too many variables. Are we cool? Are you sure? No? You got it? Right? Because if we don't love him, if we don't love him that much, then how are we going to go there? How, how do you think you're going to go there? How do you think you're going to go there? But through loving the Prophet and to love someone, you gotta know him. Yeah? You gotta know him. Imagine if you went to your mum or your dad, whoever, and he said, Oh, I heard about this dude and I want to marry him. What? Are you crazy? You just heard about him and you want to marry him. What do you know? Where is he? Where's he from? Who's his father? Who's his mother? Right? What does he do? What's he done? Where's he gone? Where's he been? That's just to marry someone. That's just here. What about to follow someone? To emulate someone. We don't know who he is. We don't know who his mother was. We don't know who his father was. We don't know how his childhood was. We don't know what he looked like, alayhi We don't know what his, what, his, what his mannerisms were. We don't know how he ate, how he sat, how he dressed, how he talked, how he walked. How are we going to love that person? How is it even acceptable? It's not even acceptable to marry someone or go into business with someone. Oh, I met someone on the train. I want to give him a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? To go. Everyone's going to go, what? Are you nuts? Are you crazy? Is something wrong with you? 
You've got to do your due diligence. You've got to make sure you know who that person is. How are we going to be the beloved of Allah if we don't know who the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is? How? It's impossible. It doesn't work. So that's in this life. What about, and who can see Allah in this life? Can't. So what about on the day when we see Allah? Allah says in the Quran, on the day of judgment, see Allah. Certain people will, certain people won't. Who on that day can go to Allah and say, forgive me? Who? Can you go to Sayyidina Adam? Will he go? Uh, Nuh, alayhi salam. Ibrahim, Khalil Allah. Why? He's the Khalil of Allah. Best buddy with Allah. BFF of Allah. Sayyidina Ibrahim, can you get? No, Musa. What about Sayyidina Musa? He's Kalim Allah. Uh, no, it doesn't work. Isa, Ruh Allah. Can't. There's only one. That's why on the day when we can see Allah, don't worry about nothing except the Prophet of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. On the day when you can see Him. But when we can't see Him, we don't want to worry about Him. How does that make sense? How is that logical? How is that reasonable? How is that acceptable? How is it acceptable for the believer when they can't see Allah to forget Rasulullah, alayhi salam, or to not ta'zim, to give Him His due, alayhi salatu wasalam, to, to you know, magnify his greatness, alayhi salatu wasalam, to talk about how awesome he is, alayhi salatu wasalam, to talk about how much we love the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, to talk about when he did this, how awesome it was, and how much we learned from it, and how much it changed the world, and changed humanity, and, and whatever it did. Yeah? Then what about then? There's only one way. If they come to the Prophet, everyone comes to all the Prophets, they say, go away, I can't help you. All the Prophets we just mentioned, except the Rasul, alayhi salatu wasalam, says, laha, ana laha. I was created for that thing because on that day, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be so, so ghadab. Wrath of Allah will be so great that he's never been so angry before, nor will he be so angry again on the day of judgment. Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine your mum, your dad, husband, wife, brother, sister, someone you love dearly being angry at you. That they've never been that angry before. You don't know what to do. Don't know how to act, what to say, how to calm them down. Allah is the only one thing that comes Allah Azza wa Jal down. That's Rasulullah I said to Salam. That's it. Nothing else. He goes to the Arsh and he makes sajda. Wala Sofi No, that's not right. Wala Sofi Atika That's the Allah Azza wa Jal. He's gonna he's gonna say, Ya Rasul, Ya Allah, forgive them. And it's only because of the intercession. Alright? Only because of the intercession of the Prophet of Allah that anyone enters Jannah. Only because of that. And we don't want to celebrate. And we've got a problem or it's haram. What do you mean it's haram? What do you mean it's haram? To celebrate, do a mawlid. Like I said, it's just a word. Mawlid. To remember when he was, was born. But not remembering just when he was born. But remembering who he was and what he did and the status that Allah Azzawajal gave him and how we want to know who he is and what he's about. So we can love him. So we can truly love him. There's one thing, like a lot of, there's a lot of you here in this month, it's haram and blah, 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 and babar shum, babar and bid'ah, and jart, and jurt, and whatever, and this, and that, and you hear heaps of stuff. You'll see heaps of stuff on the internet, on Facebook, experts, all of a sudden, those people, yeah, you know who it is? Those people that have, the, that don't follow anyone. It's those people, because they know everything, mashallah. Whoa, right? They know everything, so they're the ones who are going to be, share, Dislike, is there a dislike button? Because I wish I had one sometimes, right? Yeah. That, like this, this, that, whatever it is, etc., etc. They're the ones going off. They don't even know what they're talking about. And Imam al Karl Dawi, he's still alive, mashallah. He's one of the foremost scholars of the earth. He really summarized it really nicely. You could probably find it. He said that the only time it would be haram to do a mawlid is to do it, in other words, a celebration of the seed of the Prophet, and whether they're singing or chanting or whatever, that's all jet is in our din anyway. Right? The only time it would be haram is if someone did it on the 12th of Rabi' al Awal, the 12th of this month, and said that's the only day it's permissible to do it on. That's what he said, Imam al Qaradawi. You can probably email him if you spoke Arabic, and he, he'll respond to you. He's alive, mashallah. He's one of the foremost scholars of our time. And that's what he said. The only time it would be haram if someone did a mawlid on the 12th of, of, uh, of Rabi' al Awal, on the 12th of this month, because that that's the day they said he was born, alayhi salatu wasalam, and said it's haram or impermissible or not to do it on any other day during the year. And that's not, I haven't come across any 
group or sheikh that says that. Now, what about Jazzy? Jazzy, he said that he was singing and chanting. And what about Jazzy? It's permissible. Permissible. Sorry about that. It's it's permissible to to sing and chant. It's okay. It's not an issue. They do it to make it light, right? To make it memorable, so you can memorize it as well. That's they do those things like that. So that's that's the hukum, right? That's Imam Al Qardawi. Is not my words. It's not what I'm saying, right? I didn't make this stuff up. I don't own the deen. I don't, I'm not the only one. I don't hardly know anything about it. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And so just so you don't get weird about it. And just because someone does it as a maulid or whatever, a, a celebration of the Prophet on the 12th of the Hijjah of uh, Rabi al Awwal, the 12th of this month, it doesn't mean it's haram either. Only if they say that it shouldn't be done on any other day or it's impermissible to be done. That's it. And I haven't come across anyone ever that said that. So I, wa- I wanted to clear that up firstly. So if you're comfortable about it, how is it a bidah? Or let's say, how is it a bidah? The people who are saying it's bid'ah don't even know what bid'ah is. Bid'ah is an innovation. So the only time would be a bid'ah is to say, is to get this microphone, for example, and say the Prophet ﷺ, he had a microphone like this, and he used to pin it. How many buttons are there? One, two. Between his second and third button. That's a bid'ah. I just made it up. And I said the Prophet did it. Yeah? But if I come and get this and I put it here between the whatever second and third button... Right? It's, it's not a bid'ah. As long as I don't say the Prophet did it, it's a big, it's a big area, but that's the, the crux of it. As long as you don't say the Prophet did that, how can it be a bid'ah? How can it be a bid'ah? It can't, unless you say the Prophet did that. So, it, 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 as long as we, and, and when, we, when, we look at, when we look at that, the Prophet, he told Al Hassan ibn Thabit, he built a mimbar for him in his, in his masjid so he can do poetry. And that's basically how they do it. They do the, the prophetic, uh, the maulid, the, the life of the Prophet in poetry, because they're Arabs. They love poetry. They, that's how they express themselves. Like today, how do we express ourselves? It used to be breakdancing. Remember breakdancing in the 80s? Right? People used to breakdance. What do they do today to express themselves? They go on their face, their social media, and express themselves. So whatever, that, that was the format people expressed themselves in, is poetry. And they're not reading stuff that's that recent generally. Generally, they're reading like um, uh, what's it called, the Burda al Busairi or someone. They're reading someone's, you know. So that's it's not a bid'ah unless you say the Prophet said read the Mawlid in that way, okay. And haram, because some people say it's haram. How can the dhikr of Allah or the remembrance of the Prophet Sallallahu be haram? The only time it's haram is if you do it where the toilet is, or at a mazbala, at a place where there's resp- uh, refuse and garbage, or somewhere that's, you know. It's, it's a cover, like it's a disgusting place to do it. Other than that, other than that, and if someone's junub as well, someone's in Janaba, they're in the, a ritual state of impurity because of intercourse or whatever, because uh, of ejaculation, then they shouldn't be doing the, the re- reciting the Quran or doing the dhikr. Other than that, it's not haram. Other than that, it's not haram. You can't give the hukum, except what Imam al Qaradawi said, if someone was to do it just on the 12th of Rabi al Awwal, and say so that's the only day it's jays. So hopefully that, that clears it up for you because we don't want to have any 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 ittirab. We don't want to have any we don't want to be perturbed about the Prophet. He, he, like he says, in the ala Allah says he's Azim. His 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 um his disposition is is immense, is amazing. We can't say enough about the Prophet except to say that he's Allah when Aldu Billah. Or he's not a human being when Aldu Billah. Or to compare him to Allah in some way. He's not. No question about that. Anyone, no one says that. No, I've never come across anyone who says that. Right? So other than that, what, can, what is it that, that, he, that he didn't do? Ali? He showed us Allah. Without him, we wouldn't know about fasting. We wouldn't know about the Quran. We wouldn't know about praying. We wouldn't know how many raqat. We wouldn't know what to read in our prayers. We wouldn't know how to sit in our prayers. We wouldn't know any of these things. We wouldn't know. Even we wouldn't be praying to the Qibla. Only for the love of the Prophet that Allah changed Allah changed the Qibla, test the, 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 the believers as well, and to, to put the non believers or disbelievers on show. But it's because he used to always ask, Ya Allah, I love the Kaaba, you know, turn it back to that place. He did it for he did it for him, Ali said to Salam. And it's for his love of the Prophet that he's gonna forgive us. He's going to, the Prophet's gonna intercede for us. And none of us will enter Jannah except that we drink out of his hand, alayhi salatu salam. 
It's conditional. And he's got a hawd that's already there, alayhi salatu wasalam. He's got like a pond or a billabong if you're an Aussie. Right? He's got a, a body of water that's it's, it's wider than milk and colder than ice and sweeter than honey. And we have to we drink from it to go there. And he keeps making sajda until he appeases the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal. When we see Allah, the only way through to Allah is through the Prophet saying, when we see Allah, we're seeing Allah. What about when we don't see Allah? How much should we be connected to the Prophet of Allah So inshallah, my advice is go to a maulid, go to one of these things, the celebrations, see what it's like, feel the feeling, enjoy, have a good time. And I went to an African one the other time. They had an African one. The thing was going off, mashallah. They had these drums. It was, it was really upbeat. It was really, really nice. East African, I think it was East. Yeah, East African one. It was really good. It was awesome. And then sometimes you might even see people, they dance and things. It's not haram to dance. Dancing isn't haram. It's haram if a man dances like a woman, effeminately, that becomes haram. And it's haram if a woman dances in front of her non-mahrams. Yeah? Or it's haram if you listen to music that's inappropriate and dance to it. But there's, if sometimes you might see guys, they twirl, they spin, they do something. That's their business. But it's not haram. One time the Prophet Sallallahu he said to Sayyidina Ali and his brother Ja'far al-Tayyar, he said to, him, said to Sayyidina Ali, you're, you're most, I forget which one it was, he said to one of them, you're most like me in appearance, and he said to the other one, you're most like me in, in, in disposition. And they, they, they lost it. They lost it. They're spinning around. They, 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 they became overwhelmed. They became overwhelmed. So these things, just because someone who's doing their own thing because they don't want to follow anyone is on, you know, they've got thousands of followers even. It's, it's not, don't think it's just, you know, they they got followers, these people, but they're on their own. But they Actually, they're the ones who lead the people, but they're really on their own. They're separate from, disparate from the body, the body of, of the believers. And they're on their own. Like Albani, he's one of them. I don't want to, like, you know. But this is historical fact. He was in Damascus, and he called himself a muhaddith. Right? And the, the people of Damascus, throughout, it's one of the oldest cities in the world. One of the oldest cities, Damascus. They, the scholars of the time said he's not even a scholar. He's, you know, he's, he's, he doesn't even rate amongst the scholars. And in the end, they asked him to leave because of what he was doing. He wasn't following anyone. He was doing his own thing. Now he's got a following. Now he's got a following. This is a historical fact. You don't need to. You can look him up and you can see what happened to him. Look up his biography, how he got kicked out, and and what he went and did, and, and how he looked at the hadith. He tried, and I'll tell you later. I'll mention it, but I don't want to keep mentioning it. I'll tell you after, inshallah. Right? Um, and how he he you know what he did to Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, and he's telling him saying Bukhari made mistakes and uh, all these things, which you know a person might be entitled to do if they were of the of the reputation. If the other scholars, again, the consensus of the scholars was that person was qualified to do that. They'd all follow that person. But the exact opposite happened. They said, hey, stay away from that person. He's not really qualified. Right? So I don't want you to, to have any doubt in your heart about the Prophet of Allah. I don't want you to have any doubt in your heart about how much you should love the Prophet of Allah. Ask Sayyidina Umar. I'll finish on this. Ask Sayyidina Umar. He came up to the Prophet Right? And he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than my mum and my dad and everything, except my, my own nafs, myself. He said, sorry, sorry, Umar, it doesn't work. The Prophet said, And then Umar said, Umar, when he had to think about it, came back and said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than myself. He said, Al-Ana, Ya Umar. Now, Ya Umar. This is Sayyidina Umar al-Faruq. He, he differentiated between truth and falsehood. He learned how to do that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in the Nabiyu, or in the Rasul, in the Nabiyu, in the Nabiyu, or Rasul, in the Nabi, 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 that Allah says in the Quran, yeah, that the Prophet of Allah should take priority for the believer, the true believer, the Prophet should have priority over his or her own nafs. In other words, one's own soul. In other words, we should be, in other words, whatever he says goes above what we say. Whatever he told us goes above what we think. Whatever he taught us goes above our own philosophy. That's the group. Right? That's not being one on their own doing their own thing. That's the group. Yeah? And even the Sahabiyat, the lady Sahabis, she bring her child when the Prophet was going off to a, on a campaign. She said, Ya Rasulullah, take my baby. Rasul said, what do, what do you want me to do with your baby? 
She said, use him as a shield, Ya Rasulullah. That's how much they love the Prophet of Allah, alayhi salatu salam. Of course, the Prophet didn't do it, alayhi salatu salam. But it's an example of how much they loved him. And that's how we should love him. That's proper, right? To kind of be scared and say, oh, you know, I'm a bit worried that I'm going to do shirk. No, you're not. How are you going to do shirk? He's, Allah's Allah and he's the Prophet of Allah, alayhi salatu salam. There's no, there's no comparison between the two. There's no comparison. Allah is Allah. And Allah is what He is. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Laysa kamitli shay. Right? But the Prophet is makhluq. He was born. He had a mother. He had a father. He lived. He died. He ate. He went to the bathroom. And we know how he went to the bathroom. And we emulate that in our lives. And he died. There's, there's no comparison in that way. But who? The status given to him by Allah Azza wa Jalla. The status that he intercedes, that he taught us, that the Qur'an was revealed to him. These things. These are the things we celebrate, alayhi salatu salam. Or is there any questions about any of those things? Please ask, all right? Because if you've heard things, if, if someone said something to you, please ask so we can clarify. Because there should be none, no block between our, our love for the Prophet of Allah, salam, and our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None. Is it possible for someone to go into Jannah without the intercession of Rasulullah? It's a good question. So the question is, is it possible for someone to go into Jannah without the intercession? No one can leave the Maidan of the, day, the, the field of, of judgment day without his intercession. If the Prophet doesn't intercede for the Ummah, for the believers, Allah is going to stay angry, right? Imagine, you know, I, I, I go to court all the time, but imagine going to, like I went today actually, and the judge was angry today actually. So it was a good example, right? She was angry and she was just smashing everyone. Everyone wanted something and she didn't do anything. The cases that were in, because you normally you wait your turn till your case comes up, but you wait inside the courtroom. So people were asking for stuff, just nut, nah, I'm setting it down for trial. In other words, get your act together. Just smashing everyone. And our turn came. I wanted to go to trial, so I was all right. And straight away, her honor, she said, That's it, it's going to trial. Straight away, angry. What can you do with someone who's angry? When someone's angry and we're talking that Allah has never been angrier before. And never will be angrier again. If Allah wanted to take someone to account on one thing they did, on one look they look, one thought that they that they that they allowed to, to fester and, and, and flourish in their mind, what's going to happen? One, one thing, not a, a series of things. One thing. You knew, you believed in La Ilaha. Anyone has to go, you can go. No worries, inshallah. And you, Allah said, "Don't eat this haram," and a person ate it. Don't look at that thing. The person looked at it. What's going to happen? You know, say, oh, what's your excuse? I was going to say, oh, Ya Allah, I was a bit tired that day. Yeah, but didn't I give you your eyes? Didn't I give you your ears? Didn't I give you your faculty? Didn't I give you your body? Didn't I create the earth for you? Didn't I put the sun there to, for the earth to go around and orbit? Didn't I create gravity? Didn't I create an atmosphere? Didn't I? What are you going to answer? So in reality, in reality, Hajj, the answer is no. In reality. Because the only way Allah's anger is, Waikum Salaam Akum. The only way the anger of Allah is appeased is how? The Prophet of Allah. Mm-hmm. So if his anger is not appeased, mm-hmm. um, if the anger of Allah isn't appeased, then how is anyone going to get to Jannah? And say, oh yeah, just like the judge today, go. It's, if you want to take us to it, who lived this life without ever making one mistake ever? No one. Except that Rasulullah is different. So. In reality, that's how it is. Of course, because the ghadab of Allah, so the question is, what about those who enter paradise? Because they can't get to paradise without, they can't leave the maidan, the, the, the maidan, the field of the day of judgment without the, inter- no one's going nowhere, in other words. Allah's just going to punish people right there, send people where they have to be sent without that intercession. Because it's ghadab, it's not just the anger, it's ghadab, it's wrath. No. Does that mean he also intercedes for the umam before him? So he doesn't say, like, what about the other? Yeah, so the question is, does he intercede for the other umam? It starts off with, we're the last umam to, be, to, be, to come on earth, and we're the first umam to, to enter Jannah. And then from that, when Allah's anger is appeased, then he deals with the rest of the, of the umam. But don't forget that every prophet came, they, they, they told about Sayyidina Rasulullah, alayhi salatu wasalam. So those who believed in him from their prophet, they'll for sure get the intercession of the Prophet Wasallam. Others, I'm not sure. I don't know. One, one, one question before yours. No. Um, 
is it one on one intercession? That's a good question. Is it one on one intercession? If you're someone who's close to the Prophet, it could be a one on one intercession. Generally, it's ummati, ummati, as, as was said. He says, because every Prophet has one dua that is accepted 100%. And they, all the prophets used theirs up in this life, except the Prophet Sam saved his for the day of judgment because he knows Allah is going to be that wrathful, if that's the right word, and he's going to use it on that day. Let me let him finish and then maybe it's a related question. No, it's a separate question. Problem. Um, you said festering thoughts, you get uh, sins for your thoughts. So what I said there, in, in other words, some weird thing comes to one person's mind. right? Rather than, than measuring that up against the Sharia, what's halal, you know, the, the din of Allah, they just don't do that and they just, you know, like indulge in their own thoughts about whatever it might be and it's against the deen that a person will get accounted for that. If it's just a, 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 a fleeting thought like whatever, I want to do something that's, you know, whatever, and it's just a fleeting thought, it comes, a person processes and says, nah, that's haram or Allah wouldn't like that, the Prophet wouldn't like that, no. But only if a person says, yes, that what I'm gonna, what's in my head, like for example, someone wants to do zina, uh, adultery or fornicate. Have sex, in other words. They know it's haram, but they don't care. And they go out every day with the intention of doing zina. It's haram. If they don't do it, right? If they don't do it, they don't actually do it, they get a hasana. But the thought of wanting to do it and, and wanting to put, you know, be in a khalwa with a non mahram and things like that, it's haram. Yeah, they can't have that thought. They can't have that thought. You get a hasana for not actually doing it. That's the action. But the thought. Because it's a thought that's been thought of, that's been processed, and asar, they say, the ulama say asar. A person's adamant they want to do it. So if they don't, if the circumstance doesn't come about where, the, where they, 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 if the circumstance doesn't come about where they can do it, they're athim. But if the circumstance, in other words, they're sinful. But if the circumstance, um, if the circumstance comes about where they can do it and they don't do it, that's when they get the hasana. That's when they get the reward. You with me? So a person walking around the street going, I want to do haram, I want to do haram, I want to do haram. That's sinful. Sinful. Like we can't have that intention. Even it's sinful to support sinful thoughts. Like uh, someone doesn't drink, but they're happy that so-and-so is drinking. That's sinful too. So it's those types of thoughts that we've processed, we've thought about, and we're adamant that we want to do it. I mean, even whether we know it, we should, our thoughts should be measured up against the, the, the scale of the Sharia. It's not, like I said, fleeting thoughts. Or someone comes across their mind, they want to they see someone who's attractive or whatever, or they're feeling excited, and then they, they see, they, they want to do this, and it's a fleeting thought. It's not that. It's the person when they become, when they've had the thought, they've processed it, and they're adamant about it. That's when it's, of course, yeah. Can't go, whatever, however we think will be. So we can't go around thinking about doing hard on things. You're saying the intention part is the the, the, having the intention is the dangerous part. What's well, the haram part? Is saying that I want to do someone when I believe wants to do something that's haram. I just use sex because it's, it's out there. That's what goes on, you know. That's what all going on the internet looking for things that lead to that. that all those sorts of things, definitely. No. Is there a cap on the amount of people that get into genital fiddles? Allah subhanahu wa taala. So the question is: Is there a cap on the people that can get into genital fiddles? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he wills and does what he wants. The, the cap is the actions of those people. So this is what the scholars say. To get into Jannah, get through the doors, right, through the gates, that's only through the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the mercy of Allah, through the compassion of Allah. But the levels that we have in Jannah is according to our deeds. So that's the cap. The cap is, are there enough people who are to that standard, right, Nobel Prize winners or whatever you want, you know, they, are they that, to that level, where Allah will admit them into the highest of, of, of high paradises. Tamam? All right, so we all cook. Nah. I was just going to say, so um, recapping the entire month of the Prophet's birth, um, theoretically, the, there's the only virtue, like saying, the only virtue in this month is uh, the fact that there's other people doing it at the same time. So theoretically, you know, it could be a month in January, February, means nothing. You could... Um, Someone could just say, hey, we're doing uh, remembrance at this time, and that would be... In theory, yeah, in theory. But practically speaking, I was just making a point. Mm -hmm. So in theory, so the, in theory, it could be any month, any time. It doesn't have to be an Abiyan Awad. It could be. But the scholars use that as a catalyst, because 
why wouldn't you? you know, why wouldn't you remember the day that, and we know what day it is, why wouldn't you remember the Prophet? I was just saying that because I know there's a lot of, you know, like, even at the khutbah today, the sheikh was going off, and then he's like, it was all good at the end, he's like, be careful, don't do mahalits. Like, what are you on about? Like, are you serious? After that great khutbah that you gave, you gave the whole seer of the Prophet Salam and he said, what are you doing? Like, that's, you, you, you're taking people away from remembering the Prophet Salam and his biography. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's the, that's the antithesis. That's the opposite of what our deen is about. So this was uh, a little bit different to sort of maybe what Sahab was doing, but it's mainly being done recently because we're sort of not remembering the Prophet as much, so it's used as an excuse. It's, and it's not now. It's been through the generations of, of the, you know, the Ummah has done that. The Ummah has done that for, for generations. Yeah. They've remembered the Prophet. Sallam. But it's like a little bit different to maybe what Sahab was doing because maybe they were close well, to the Prophet. Right, the Sahaba, they used to praise the Prophet. ﷺ. They used to make poetry to say to his face, Ali So it's an extension of that. Yeah. That's a good question. Like focusing it, condensing it into like a month well, now, uh, now we, don't, we don't use the words because they, they said, like a couple of abiyat, um, what are they called poetry house? No. Yeah, stanzas. Stanza? No, they're not stanzas, are they? Is it a stanza of poetry? Two lines? All right. They used to use, only say a few stanzas of poetry. Couplets, whatever, whatever, whatever the technical term for poetry rather than prose is. They used to say a couple, but now they do it like this East African I one one eight four was a killer. I went for like six hours, mashallah. These guys were going they got stamina those Africans, man, mashallah. Is that racist? But, mashallah, they, they they kept on mashallah, like they were going. They kept on going. So because they make it longer, they use different, you know, different um different poets different poetry than was used by the by the Sahaba. But the Sahaba used to make poetry and say it to his face, Ali Satusanam. So it's not, it's not an innovation in that way, mm. but it is an extension of what they used to do, and, and in our faith, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And where it can overstep the bounds is where you start attributing things that are only to Allah to the Prophet. Hundred percent. Asking um, Rasulullah for forgiveness, or you're asking Rasulullah to you know, provide you with something. Yeah. So, like in terms of the Prophet of Allah Sallam. Of course we can ask him to forgive us because he's given a sunnah and if we're not following that sunnah, we're not following his way, Ya Rasulullah, forgive me for not following your way. Like if someone's wronged you, they would ask for your forgiveness. So it's not that. But when we give the qualities of, of, of God, of, um, of ulahiya as they say, of um, divine, attributes. divine attributes, then of course. But you won't see that at a molid. Like what sort of things would, would be wrong? Um, to say that, you know, he's as stakhfirullah. I mean, it's yeah. kufr to say stuff like that. Right, but to say that um, you know him and Allah are the same, or he's a God stuck for Allah, when all the things like that. But you're not going to hear that at a molid. I mean, I, I've never gone to any of the molid in anywhere I've been. People don't say that, but some people because they fear that's going to happen, they say it's haram. But that's not our deen. Our deen doesn't, especially when the Prophet said you can use your whole time to make salawat upon me. That would be the big scare, wouldn't it? Don't worry about remembering Allah. Just make salawat upon me. Because when you make salawat upon the Prophet, you are remembering Allah. You're, you're right. So is there any other I'll ways come to you. You're on Fadl. Is there any other ways to help distinguish it from the um, ways that the other religions have gone where they've sort of elevated their Prophets to a higher level? Is there any way to or prevent us from going in that direction? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's a good, that's a good question. So how, how do we stop it how do we stop it from becoming something like other faiths where they make their prophet a god? We follow the jama'ah. We follow the, the congregation, as, as the prophet said, mentioned. We don't become that lone wolf because the reason, the reason why other faiths have gone that way is because they left the traditions. They made their own things, the Treaty of Nicaea, right? They made the deal with, with the Caesar at the time. They, you know, these things, as, as long as we don't go on our own and make our own things and we stick with the jama'ah, we'll be fine, inshallah. Because it's tried and proven. Over centuries. No. Just a practical application of what you're just saying. I mean, we all have people in our lives that like to show us how to practice our religion. This is how to So if someone comes to us and says that, how do we actually have that interaction? Do we just leave it as a sort of thing? Or do we, I don't know, some attempt to engage in a discourse? Or Yeah, I mean, if, if, like from what we said today, you can use some of the examples that have been said that I, I took from, from you know, the, 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 the vast body of scholars that you know that basically there aren't any scholars that don't get involved in Mawalid, really, real scholars anyway. So the, be 
depends on the person. If they if they want to learn, so the question is, should we bother engaging with someone that says, for example, Maori is haram or bidah, whatever it might be. If the person's rational and reasonable and you can communicate with them, then why not? But if the person if the person is just one one way traffic, the person doesn't want to listen, they just want to say what they want, then you know, then you can only say what the Prophet of Allah SWT says, why did Anna Jahilin? If someone is is ignorant, you know, Allah ala ilmin, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguided that person even though they're knowledgeable. And there's not much you can do, but make dua for that person. Wake up at the Hajjur and make dua. But certainly, if you can engage in discourse, why? You can ask the question, what, on what basis are you saying it's haram? Things in our deen are only haram from two ways. Either Allah said it's haram and it's in the Quran, or the Prophet said it's haram and it's in the Ahadith. That's it. They're the only two legislators. Well, Allah is the only legislator. He's the ultimate legislator, but He's given the Prophet of Allah that capacity through the revelation. That's it. Okay? Um, when, when it comes to, for example, smoking, and they say it's haram, right? Because it's detrimental. It's tied. It's already tied to something that's haram, t- drinking poison, for example. It's already tied to that, so it's an extension of that. Whereas the mold is an ex- extension of the remembrance of the Prophet. Wasallam. How can you say that's haram? It's impossible. Someone else? Would, it's not. I'm a really dumb person, but will Jesus or like, yeah, what are, like, in the state for the Christians or the Jews? So, that's a good question. Will the prophet of that calm that people intercede for them? Like, there's, in terms of what happens on the, in the Day of Judgment, there's heaps of different um, narrations, some stronger than others. But the, the understanding that I have from it could be incorrect as well. The understanding that, that I've got from it is firstly the Prophet of Islam will intercede and then that's his job. He'll intercede on behalf of those prophets who'll intercede on behalf of those people. That's, that's his job, alayhi salatu wasalam. Ana laha. That's what he says. So the intercession will come from the Prophet of Allah How do we distinguish Maulid from Hadith? The e-celebration? Because we're only having two e's. That's a good question. So how do we distinguish the Maulid from the Eid? The Eid is Eid. This is Dhikra, Maulid Rasulullah. This is the remembrance of the... It's not a Eid. They say Eid in a colloquial sense. What's Friday? Friday is Eid. Right? Friday is also a Eid for us in that way. And it comes across in the, in the tradition as well. The prophetic tradition is mentioned as a Eid. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's in, in terms of the words that are used, they convolute the, the, the situation rather than cleaning up the, clearing up the situation. The situation is clear. What, what is halal? An extension of what's halal is halal. And what's haram? An extension of what is haram is haram. So say things like clothing, gifts, and all sorts of stuff specifically for Eid. Try not to intermingle the two. Well, no, the, 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 the righteous people, because of their love for the Prophet, they use it as an excuse to give charity as well. They use it as an excuse to give charity. They use it like Juma. They use it as an excuse to feed people, an excuse to also give charity. So now you can do that as well, but it's it's not Eid. There's only two Eids, and it's Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr, and Eid of Friday. That's, there's no doubt that that's the case. But we, we, there's no prohibition on celebrations in our faith. Yeah, there's no prohibition on celebrations as long as they're done in a halal way, in a permissible way. There's, there's, it's not it's not prohibited for us to to celebrate and enjoy ourselves. Why wouldn't we with the time with the Prophet Like, he, let, let me give it to you another way. Let me give it to you another way. When you see, inshallah ta'ala, the Prophet of Allah on the Day of Judgment, how are you going to be? How are you going to be? I want someone to tell me. It's a question that I'm asking. It's not rhetorical. Okay, let's, let's, let's set the scene a little bit. Yeah? The sun's here. People are sweating up to here. People are biting off their, you know, they're biting their nails off to their, their shoulders. Children's hair is going grey. Pregnant women are giving birth to their children. It's absolute mayhem. Everyone's naked. No one notices anyone else's nakedness. And then you see the Prophet Sami calls you. Sure. How are you going to be? It's not going to be. <laughs> it's going to be a party, man. What are you talking about? It's going to be a literal party. Literally, it's going to be a party. Where do you go when he calls you? Where do you go? To where? Under the where? Arsh. What are people doing under the Arsh of Allah? They're reclining. It doesn't say sitting. So when people are reclining, what are they doing? What? If you're not going to be happy when you see the Prophet of Allah on the Day of Judgment, inshallah, when are you going to be happy? 
Tell me when you're going to be happy. When? When you have a kid, yeah, that's great. When you get married, awesome. When you graduate, oh, fantastic. When you get cash, stupendous. <laughs> but no, you're not going to be happier than that time. Those people under the Arsh of Allah are reclining. People who recline, are take, they're, they're partying for use of a, you know, of a colloquialism. How can you not be happy when you mention the Prophet's name, alayhi salatu wasalam? How can you not be happy? He loves you more than you love yourself. He wants more benefit for you than you want for yourself. How can you not be happy to see someone like that? When someone did you a favor once upon a time and you see that person, you don't get happy? They helped you out and from a hard situation, they advised you, dropped you off, picked you up, gave you money, told you to go see that person. You don't imagine the person is going to save you from hellfire. He's interceding from the ghadab of Allah. Of course you're going to be happy. How are you not going to celebrate? Because we don't have a vulk. Yeah? We read black and white, black and white, black and white, black and white, black. We don't even understand what it means to love the Prophet. We don't even understand what it means to him to intercede for us on the day of judgment. We don't even understand what it means to see him on the day of judgment. He's got a liwat. He's got a big flag. To be under that flag. If you get a hold of that flag on the day of judgment, what are you going to do? Don't just stare at me like stunned mullets. Hey, exactly. You gotta wave the flag. Yeah? Of course. Of course. That's, that's our deen. That's who it is. That's what it is to. How are you gonna not love someone like that? That's the reality. Because we have no flavor for it, or those people talking about it in particular have no flavor on our I mean, go do what you want. Go, go, go. See if it gets you in. See if it gets you in. I prefer to follow those that have come before me, that have a connection to the Prophet better than I do, that showed the way. And they're a, a vast number compared to those who are against. No. Sorry. That's okay. Um, when we talk about like, giving an intercession, like, obviously, unfortunately, Muslims that go to hellfire, what I got to understand how that works, giving an intercession, like, what time to go to All right. So the Prophet's going to intercede. Some people are going to go to hellfire. Now, there's a lot of different theories about that. The, the theory that after reading all the different opinions, what, what I think is the, hell, the Day of Judgment is 1,000, 50,000 years. For that period, those people will be in the hellfire because of what they did. The, those people have to be cleansed because no one can enter the hellfire unless they have basically the disposition, of the prophetic disposition. That's basically heaven. Heaven, heaven, excuse me. No one can go to heaven unless they have. That's why we drink. Out of the, from his hand, and we change completely, and we're happy, and we never nail them abada. We never get thirsty after that. We basically hit that that level, right? Basically, how he was in this world, Ali said to say. Basically, it's not exactly, but we become different people, right? And we take the form of Sayyidina Adam and the akhlaq of the Prophet said, in that sense, right? So, those that aren't to that level, they have to be purified. Those believers that aren't to that level. That to be, like someone, the hadith is clear hadith. That person said, La ilaha illallah, once sincerely from their heart. That's all they did. The rest of the time, debauchery, alcoholism, whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay, that person has to be purified. So that person is purified, and that time, at the whole time, the per, what's the Prophet doing? He's interceding for that person. The whole time. Saying, Ya Allah, what about that person? Ya Allah, that person. Ya Allah, that person. So Allah, the ghadab comes down of Allah, and then Allah pulls the person out, takes them to Jannah. All right? Tamam? Like it's party, man. Don't you want to party? This is it. Rabi al-Awwal. If you're not happy when the Prophet's name is mentioned, you're not happy when you go to a mawlid, how are you going to be happy on the Day of Judgment? How? How are you going to recline? So, I know I'm making it that, but that's really how it is. That's really, really how it is. صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد عليه وسلم. Any questions about any of those things? الله سبحانه يوفقكم يرفع درجاتكم يجعل هذا الشهر مبارك عليكم على أهليكم على أمهاتكم وأباءكم وأقاربكم وجيرانكم والأمة أجمع وسائل الخلق أجمع إن شاء الله عز وجل الله سبحانه وتعالى يجعلنا متوصلين به عليه الصلاة والسلام متابعين له ولسنته ومحبوبين عنده ونحبه أكثر من نحب أنفسنا ونسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى يتقبل منا ويسأل الله to accept us and elevate our status ويسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى to make the Prophet the most beloved thing to us and make us beloved 
Muhammad, to the Prophet Allah, and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month to make so those people who truly emulate the Prophet of Allah salam, to make so those people that, that truly love the Prophet of Allah salam, and who get his intercession and to recline with the Prophet Allah salam, on the day of judgment and to drink from his hand, from his hawd, uh, that will never be thirsty after that, inshaAllah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to give us a place with the Prophet of Allah salam, in Jannah, near the Prophet of Allah salam, in Jannah, that we see the Prophet of Allah salam, every day, inshaAllah. بخير ولطف وعافية ولحضرة النبي بالسر الفاتحة